I'm well aware there's a lot of constant readers out there who think we have had way too much of Ms. Gibney from Stephen King, but I'm still trying to go in with some Holly Hope. Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Heyo to Stephen King. That is Reezy, and uh, yes, this is the first one of these that I've done in a great long while. I'll keep it very abbreviated. I've been extremely busy with uh, a return to film and media studies at Arizona State. So after over 330 episodes of it on the horror show, it has been tough trying to maintain these. Some have been on uh, Infoigotainment. We also did the Boogeyman review on the horror show, myself and Cecil. And so it's been kind of all over the place whenever time permits. But obviously with the release of a new King novel, especially one starring... Pretty much it seems like his favorite character as of late because of how much she has been involved in. I am talking none other than Holly Gibney and the new novel. I should just basically show first and foremost, this is how many Holly Gibney stories she has had an involvement in. So yeah, are you not surprised that she is like the second most seen character of all of King's work aside from Roland Deschain? Yeah, <laughs> kind of crazy. But today I'm giving a non-spoiler review because there is a lot to spoil on this one. So I'm going to keep it, uh, you know, just uh, walking on eggshells, making sure that I don't really uh, divulge too much. But we're talking Holly, simply Holly. And uh, yeah, man. So I know there's a lot of derision, unfortunately, for this particular character. And I know it's because some people are a little annoyed with her eccentricities. I know there's other people, and I have fallen prey to this admittedly myself, that are just like, all right, King, give it a rest. We know she is almost like a more neurotic stand-in for yourself, especially with some of her sensibilities, you know, like tasting movies and food and things of that nature. So all too often when I'm reading Holly Gibney, I see a lot of King, you know, at least as far as aspects of his personality that he has laid bare for all of his constant readers. Yeah, I see a lot of Gibney in his writing, and so of course I can tell the reasoning behind why he likes to return to her character. And he has done it now for the sixth time, I believe it is. Yes, so this solo novel is her first, like, full length. And yet, I find it kind of interesting in the fact that they're billing it as the first First story where Holly is taking center stage, but that actually happened in If It Bleeds from 2020, the title novella, which was the lengthiest piece in that collection of four stories. But yeah, she made her first appearance in the June 2014 release of Mr. Mercedes, which was the first in the Bill Hodges trilogy. And as he has gone on record to say various times, he's like, Holly was a late addition and kind of an afterthought, but I just fell in love with her. Obviously, because of the fact that he has continued to go back to that proverbial well of sorts. But also, we knew very well, just based on some of the uh, hard case crime stuff that he had written, like, King is very enraptured in that and has been in this sort of, like, mystery, crime-solving sort of stuff. Uh, sometimes the supernatural uh, jumps in there. Sometimes it stays fairly grounded. It just all depends on how he, you know, decides to approach it. But, yeah, he's been very much into that sort of storytelling, and you can very much tell. And he's also said in various interviews that he really digs reading that kind of stuff, man. And so, hey, it, I kind of understand it. But um, so this is technically, yeah, her first full-length novel where she is the main star. She is our predominant protagonist. And yet you're going to get a lot of familiar faces if you have read any of those other stories, you know, the previous, <laughs> previous five that have included her. And so lots of references. Now, will I say that you have to have read all of these books to actually, you know, enjoy Holly? No, not necessarily. It's one of those situations where you will most definitely get more fulfillment, but the thing that I will say, and it is kind of a, it's, it's a nitpick, you know, it's a slight annoyance before I get into like overall thoughts and a little bit about the story as much as I can say, you know, is that King tries to keep these self-contained enough so that if one of his casual readers, so not his constant readers, you know, the different CRs, decide, hey, I was at the airport and I saw that new Stephen King book. I don't know who the hell Holly is. I'll pick it up. Why not? I've read a few Stephen King books. I've read Misery, you know, or I've read 112263. And so something that he employs, not just in this, but I... This is coming up late because of the fact that the book has been out for a week at this particular point and uh, there is a, it was kind of a tactic week with personal stuff going on and I uh, didn't have the time to get to it between school and various other things that were going down in my life. But I also wanted to go back through 
all of those other books. So I wanted to go back through Mr. Mercedes and Finders Keepers and, and The Watch and The Outsider. You know, they uh, adapted all four of those stories into television. And so The Outsider was a series that was on HBO. It got lots of awards. It was heavily celebrated by critics. Many people said that it was an improvement upon the source material. And then I personally adored much more so the Bill Hodges adaptation of the trilogy that was done with, uh, well, it was originally the AT&T Audience Network, which is now defunct. And thankfully those three seasons of exceptional television that starred Brendan Gleeson as Bill Hodges um, they migrated over to Peacock, so that's where you can stream those now. Uh, on the Horror Show channel, there are reviews of all four seasons of, so The Outsider and then the three seasons of the Mr. Mercedes television series. But yeah, so Holly has been all over, not just in print, man. She has had two different actresses portray her. She has, uh, you know, once again, she's been in six different novels at this point. And so, yeah, busy lady. And yet the self-contained aspect that I was referencing is the fact that King tries to like bring people up to speed who haven't necessarily read any of these other stories. So if he brings up, uh, for instance, the villain from The Outsider, he gives some context about things that happen. So I could understand the intention for you know a completely oblivious reader, but for somebody like me who has read and reread all of these stories multiple times at this particular point in the near decade since the character was debuted, gets to be a little plotting. It gets to be like, okay, you know, again, we have to give this explanation about something that happened like two books ago in the character cycle of Holly. And so, you know, that sort of small little nitpick aside, um, I enjoyed this story. Would I go so far as to say I loved it? Like, you know, the Hodges trilogy? No, not necessarily. And I'm going to be doing a separate video at some point soon, hopefully. You know, I mean, with school schedule, it's always a little bit weird. But I, having reread through all of these books, I'm going to rank all of the Holly Gibney stories, you know, from, in my estimation, you know, the weakest to the strongest, you know. I hate using, like, best to worst because I actually really appreciate all of the stories that she has starred in, and I gained a newfound appreciation for certain ones, but as far as this latest release that just came out in the birth month of not just myself, but Psy King, let's talk Holly for a second. And so, well, longer than that, but you guys know what I mean. So, uh, once again, I am not going to divulge big things like villain, intention, things of that nature, but this essentially takes place right after the uh, previously mentioned If It Bleeds, so that was a Holly starring story, and you had the two members of the Robinson family who had appeared in the Bill Hodges trilogy, at least. I'm trying to remember if, uh, I know there's mention of Jerome and Barbara in, uh, in The Outsider, but they don't really play a pivotal part or anything of that nature. I think it's just, you know, random reference, because that's very much its own side story, whereas If It Bleeds and definitely this novel are much in line with the Hodges trilogy, uh, whether you've read them or not. And so, yeah, you've got the Robinson family returning, and they were key components in the If It Bleeds, um, the villain. Without, I'm going to try not to spoil those other books in case, hey, you just want to know about Holly, about this particular story. And so, yes, the Robinson family, who were characters, siblings, brother and sister, that were introduced in the original Mr. Mercedes novel, they are still around, and they are pivotal. And that's one of my favorite things about this is that I really do like the Holly character, even though it has been kind of overkill with her and the the uh, you know the Robinson family siblings. I still really dig these three characters, and you know we also get uh, Pete, which is Bill Hodge's former partner, who has come on to this private investigation agency that Holly Gibney essentially started with Bill Hodges, and then. Um, stuff happened without really getting super spoilery and so Bill's former partner who was in The Outsider and who I believe is briefly mentioned in If It Bleeds, he's in this. We also have Izzy who uh, was uh, in Isabella, the, uh, uh, the partner, well former partner at this particular point of, uh, of Pete who is now working with Holly since, uh, since Pete retired. So you've got, without getting too much into it, you've got a lot of returning characters that were all mentioned at various points in all of the Hodges tie-in stories that Holly was a part of. And so so um, this is another case that she's on, and I couldn't help but think to myself, I'm just like, damn, these three characters getting into a situation once again for like the umpteenth time, and I was just like, this is obviously Ka willing it, so to speak, but 
man, just the uh, countless coincidences of the most dire, horrible, life-threatening things going down. But then again, I immediately kind of, I was like, fuego, slow your roll, bro, because of the fact that if you had, I mean, I read a few of them when I was growing up, you know, Hardy Boy stories and, you know, a little bit of Nancy Drew and things like that. And also, if you've seen procedural shows, you know, any of the detective or mystery shows, you know, even like Murder, She Wrote, whatever, like, the, basically when you're looking into crime and, and evil shit, yeah, evil shit finds you and you find yourself in these sort of life-threatening situations. And so I guess that is another grasping at straws, but I do kind of roll my eyes a little bit, but yet still understand in contrast that it is kind of a, okay, check your brain in at the door just a little bit, that there is this Un there's another sort of just insane situation that these three characters find themselves in. Now, this has some controversy amongst people dependent upon, I guess, political affiliation. Now, as I have said countless times on Hail to Stephen King, I'm a registered independent. I'm definitely, like, I lean left with certain things, right with certain things. Most of my friends are liberal. My parents are, uh, you know, uh, very very uh, conservative, you know? And so for that reason, I guess I do end up somewhere in the middle. And uh, I'm not gonna express my personal politics, but Stephen King, he is crazed about letting his politics be known. And I don't even say crazed so much as the fact that he's very overt about it, he's very diligent about it, very outspoken about it, whether it's on Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're calling it now, or in his books. And this is most definitely since he deliberately has it taking place in 2021 during the uh, you know, COVID, the, uh, the the C-19, you know, the, the virus that shall not be named, Captain Trips, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, and that is another thing that in If It Bleeds, in this book, this, I guess at this point, has to be considered another turn of the wheel, a uh, different level of the tower, as I like to say, so to speak, because of the fact that he wrote that book in, uh, you know, 2019, and it was published in 2020, like right around the time when all the Pandeezy stuff was really getting scary and horrible and everything and um you know obviously sincerest condolences to any who uh, had loved ones or you know you know friends whatever it may be um you know or just have lingering afflictions i know that there's a lot of people who you know they still have like whether it's respiratory stuff covid fog whatever it may be uh, but so i'm not going to go into that extensively but king most definitely has it be a point of constant discussion and Holly Gibney being a character that is notoriously very germaphobic and you know that's the way she was wired as a character even before you know all of the stuff went down in 2020 and so yes um this makes no mention of it in the Ithic Bleed story and so for that reason um King expresses disappointment in the afterword here about the fact that I wasn't going to go back and rewrite I have to just let you know, just let it be, just leave it out there, and so on and so forth. But all of this in this book basically mentions, you know, the fact that there was obviously things going down in 2020, which was when, you know, that story, the uh, the title story, if you please, was taking place. So, hey, once again, uh, this is obviously all, an almost identical uh, version of Holly and Jerome and uh, Barbara and Pete and so on. But uh, yeah, obviously, this is just one of those slightly different alternate universes where, you know, there actually was a, uh, a, a pandemic. And so, yeah, the newest case that Holly is consulted about in this particular story just so happens to be going down at the same time that she is having extensive reflection about her contentious relationship with her mother, Charlotte, which has been kind of hanging over her head throughout all of the stories. When we first meet Holly Gibney in the Mr. Mercedes book, you know, it's very apparent that she is, uh, she's very just mild-mannered and eccentric and depressed and just like living in her shell. And it's because of this sort of domineering, overly protective mom who has, you know, given some mistreatment. And Holly has a lot of reflection in this story about her childhood, going more extensively in depth about things like, you know, her, uh, the, the harassment from men that she had experienced, her times uh, being institutionalized twice, things of that nature. But it also explores just the love-hate dynamic that you can often have with a loved one, whether it's a parent or, you know, uh, any sort of family member specifically. And uh, there's a similar dynamic going on with 
a girl uh, by the name of, uh, oh boy, I just got, I gotta finally consult the notes, guys. So, uh, the name of the girl who has gone missing, which is the crux for Holly being consulted about this, is Bobby Ray, or excuse me, Bonnie Ray. And then uh, you've got Penny, her mother, uh, Penelope, and she's the one who consults Holly Gibney based on a recommendation, and she's like law enforcement, uh, which most notably Izzy, uh, Pete's former partner and somebody who butted heads with Bill Hodges in the past a little bit. Um, local law enforcement in the, uh, uh, in Ohio where this takes place uh, is essentially not really doing much and that's often what happens with missing persons is they're like okay did they run away are they missing did they not want to be found are they like were they kidnapped and you know murdered whatever it may be and so yeah for that reason law enforcement they like they do what they can and they report to you know uh, different precincts and different organizations FBI and you know missing persons lists and all this different national databases but there, there comes a point where there's not much else they can do and so that's why Penny consults uh, Holly and is like, I need to find out where my daughter is, what's going on. And that's the major mystery of this story. Now, once again, I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, and uh, I'm not going to spoil the nature of the villains in this either, you know, or villain, villain, villains, who knows? There, there could be one, there could be many. Now, when I was reading the original, I think it was uh, something published in Entertainment Weekly, and it was like the first couple pages or, you know, chapter one, part one kind of thing, and you meet this character, and uh, he's at this local university, and he's about to turn 40, and it's somebody who's in their late 30s as well and stuff, and you're just thinking about health issues, and he has these music and whatever and then something happens to him I felt that just the fact that they put that out there was a little bit of a spoiler because it kind of gives you a hint about what's going down I'm not even gonna give that hint because when I read that and I read it out loud on a Tale of the Stephen King episode when I previewed this uh, this novel a few months before it was released here in September I was just like oh man I kind of think I figured it out and I think I even made some predictions now I was kind of half right but um, Still, I feel like that was a little on the obvious side. And if we're going to make a direct comparison with The Outsider, which I think is the most of mystery ilk in comparison uh, with this book, I, I will say that this has less of an essence of mystery uh, because early on in The Outsider, you're trying to figure out the conundrum of how someone could be in two places at once and did this person actually do it based on evidence and, you know, could there have been another person or something bigger and outside of this world going down? And we do have some of those suppositions here, but King employs a certain sort of narrative structuring in this, but you know how much he likes to, if you've read enough Stephen King, how he likes to do timeline jumping. And so he'll be like, okay, here's the present as it's written at the time when he was doing it. And he's like, and then we're gonna jump back in you know, a few years or in the case of it, something like that, a few decades. And uh, yeah, he does that here. And the two times are like kind of slowly, like the, the previous time is slowly catching up with the present time, which is where Holly is beginning her investigation, you know, following her breadcrumbs, all that different stuff. And um, it kind of makes it obvious about, you know, fates of certain people, how certain things went down, you know, uh, things of that nature. And so that was another just little great, I guess. And now I'm, I'm having to consult the notes at least just a little bit because, um, yeah, man, I mean, I, I found a lot to appreciate here. I've, I've hit a lot of them, so there's not really a lot else to go through. Uh, but um, I, I've hit a lot of them. Most notably, I really did appreciate with the villainous presence what King did. It's something a little bit different than I think that he has done. And having, you can see the Tower of Tomes beside me if you haven't seen Hail the Stephen King before or any of those uh, hundreds of episodes. God damn, so many. Uh, but um, he's never really done this before, and I've read everything Stephen King, including um, only collected in weird, obscure little, um, you know, things done by smaller press and whatever. So, yeah, this is very much a unique story with the exception, well, I can't even say that because, you know, that, that would be kind of a spoiler and I don't want to do that. But, um, yeah, so it's essentially Holly going on the trail um, in this uh, just university area, which is close by the town in Ohio where she resides and has this Finders Keepers detective agency that she is soldiering on with. And so, yeah, it, there's a lot of familiar elements here, though, and that's where I could be a little bit more critical, if not for the fact that there is enough development of all three of our main returning characters that I liked a lot. You know, um, Jerome and his sister, they're both writing now. And there's a very interesting, like, the, the character that I think grows more than anybody in this is probably Barbara, who is uh, Jerome's younger sister, um, as she is embracing her talents without getting into too many specifics. And she has an interesting relationship with a local literary mentor, which is cool. Um, Jerome is a little bit more relegated, with the exception of one character that he gets 
involved with, and it's one of the more pivotal things. King returns to it, and I wasn't necessarily expecting that he would, so and once again, that's not spoiling anything. I'm keeping it very vague. Um, and then Holly, with the additional exploration of her past, most notably the stuff with her mom and uh, with her uncle, and some revelations about the both of them, and including something that happened with um, her cousin that ties all the way back to the first book with Bill Hodges, Mr. Mercedes. And so that was an interesting dynamic as well. Um, you know, uh, King essentially wanted to write this story, as he says in, uh, in some of the press that's going around right now, because of the fact that he wanted to have something set during the pandemic, and yes, he is very heavy-handed about it at times, but it didn't really bother me very much, you know? Um, political affiliations aside, he does beat it like a red-headed dead horse occasionally, as far as some of the discourse, but it's really not the central theme, like some people may be presuming. It's totally not. The central theme is the the villainousness, yeah, uh, silly word, right, that Holly is trying to track down and discover, you know, just what is going down with it, you know, who and why, motivation, and all that other stuff, and the unexpected aspects of all of that. And the fact that we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, both grounded, you know, here on Earth, uh, you know, just very, you know, within reality sort of situations, and then you've seen Supernatural. And so, yeah, those are interesting aspects as you're going through the story. You're like, you know, is this going to have a part? Is it not going to be? You know, and so on. And so that's good. And, um, but yeah, it's really just a character study of Holly in a lot of ways, how she is getting along, you know, as uh, to her uncle was ailing at the end of the Ific Blades. I guess that's just a very, very tiny little spoiler. And, uh, you know, just, you know, continued issues with her mother, similar friction between the mother of the missing girl that she's trying to track down, um, you know, those two as well, and how it kind of mirrors Holly and her mom's dynamic. And so, uh, yeah, but once again, I, the same problem I had with The Outsider I had with this, in the fact that the middle of the book as all of the like you know procedural stuff is going down and just going and interviewing this person trying to figure out some more information and trying to like you know just just once again follow the 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 trail of breadcrumbs and everything and getting closer and closer but it's it really slows down to like a snail pace in the middle of this book it starts out strong and i i will contend this book ends very strong it really does it's fulfilling and king gets to really flex a sick sense of humor. I was laughing and yet just like, oh God, I shouldn't be laughing about that. <laughs> like, just things that are said, uh, in little bits of dialogue and thoughts by certain characters, man. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, I, I will put it that way. But, um, but I, I totally scurried away from what I was trying to say about the fact that King wanted to write about a Zoom funeral and it's something that we get early on in this. And uh, just, you know, that was kind of the nature of things. And I mean, I know that with different variants and mutations and all this other stuff, it's probably still happening with a lot of people in certain circles, you know, if you did or did not get vaxxed, whatever, you know, your, your thoughts and your allegiances are, that's obviously totally your jam and your game, and I'm not here trying to be preachy about anything. Um, you know, another thing, um, despite the strength of the first and the third act and the fact that it was a little bit weaker in the middle, this wasn't some of the most engaging prose that I've had from King, and by that I mean like as far as just, it, it didn't flow quite as much. I had similar issues with fairy tale at times, and there weren't as many like just killer memorable lines. Now, once again, there was the sixth sense of humor and the, like another bit, Holly is taking up smoking again. That's not really a spoiler, I guess, because, you know, King has always been like, once a smoker, always a smoker. You know, I fall into that criteria, even though I avoid them like the plague, I still fall prey every now and again, you know, as he has admitted, he's like, he's like after, you know, 30 years of sobriety and so on and so forth, the one thing that I still, I occasionally have a cigarette. And it's just like, well, yeah. And Holly, unfortunately, is back to like just, Chimney style, man, you know, and King describes it at one point as free basing nicotine. And I was just like, wow, Sai, all right, man, that's cool, whatever. Um, and uh, an another one when there is um, there's a loss of a certain character, no specifications as to who, whether it's big or small or whatever, um, and a world of words dies with her. And I found that to be extremely cathartic and just, you know, but yet the words remain, so I don't know, maybe the that's up for in interpretability, but I still thought that there was something very profound about that particular statement, especially coming from a writer himself. And then another thing that he observes is, you know, uh, hold honors are never able to understand let goers. And I think that that is very much just how you are wired as a person. 
it goes down to your character and, and your personhood. And it's not really a positive or a negative thing to be one or the other. But I can definitely relate to the fact as somebody who at various points in my life has had difficulty letting go of whether it was somebody I was in a relationship with or whether it was, you know, just, you know, being in a job that I knew was sucking the life out of me and just writing was on the wall sort of status and you're just unwilling to. And yet the people who have such a freeing aspect of just being able to very easily let go as opposed to holding on, it's mentioned very passingly, you know, and yet I also, that really resonated with me and I found it to be quite, uh, quite intriguing. But uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it's just really funny to me in the fact that, you know, Holly herself is, you know, as you would expect from Holly, Holly is supremely, you know, pro-vaccination and really hates on anybody who was against that sort of thing. And, you know, King has even said, once again, in local press that, you know, he was not out to make people who, you know, were thinking the coronavirus was this or that as opposed to legit. You know, he wasn't trying to just steamroll those sort of people and he wanted to. Uh, and there was one character in particular in this, and it is one of the more crucial ones that, um, he doesn't exactly portray them in the best light, but it's not because of their thoughts on that. It's for different reasons. And so um, it's not completely respectful, but it's more so than I think a lot of people who have heard, oh, he just hates on anti-vaxxers or whatever. Yeah, it's not that sort of thing. Um, and yet, yeah, Holly Gibney, despite all of those you know, convictions and stuff, she's still chain smoking throughout and it's like, yeah, well, it affects your respiratory system, right? And she even, later in the book, she's just like, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a hypocrite. She she thinks that to herself, which I was like, okay, King, thank you for at least addressing it, because I couldn't help but, you know, think about it. But then, at another point, he has her thinking, uh, she hears about somebody dying of lung cancer from secondhand smoke, like what happened to Christopher Reeve's wife. And, you know, Holly's like, wow, it makes me think less uh, about uh, the horrendousness of my habit. And I'm just like, Damn, Holly, all right, I, you know, you, that's beyond quirkiness, that's selfishness right there. But once again, personal opinion. Uh, as far as lots of Easter eggs, I mean, there's not really a lot of them, aside from constant mention of Inside View, which you had in a few of the different Hodges stories and in If It Bleeds. Um, it, it's mentioned a lot, it's the publication that was involved in The Dead Zone, also in The Night Flyer, and so they're, they're kind of like a sleaze tabloid sort of situation, so they're mentioned a bit, but really beyond that, as far as callbacks to any King stuff, like really deep, deep Easter eggs, no, not really. It's just references to all of the previous Holly adventures and misadventures, you know, uh, and including Jerome and Barbara as well. And really, um, all of those are given kind of exhaustive context for those who haven't read any of those previous books, as I mentioned. And so I feel like maybe this is coming off as more dislike than I want it to. And that is like 100% the furthest from the intention that I have here. So all of the stuff that I really dug about this book, it's in that spoil territory, man. You know, because I did quite like this book. Once again, I didn't love it. And I have like the, the non-spoiler stuff is the things that I can dance around and the things that I can compare to stuff I didn't like about some of these previous books. But yeah, the, the real juicy good stuff is when it like the, the curtains are pulled back and you start to realize what's really going on. And then you're like, oh, that's really what's going on. Now that's not to say it's, it may be original to stuff that King has done. Is it completely original as far as the context of that sort of story that this cell, uh, that that's, that this reveals itself to be? Um, I can't wait to talk about this in the spoiler capacity because of the fact that, yes, I do have a few things where I think it is very obvious uh, King derived some inspiration from. So anybody who has read the book already or knows what this is actually about, and thankfully the, the dust jacket keeps it pretty vague. Um, but yeah, you will definitely know when, whenever I can finally get around to doing a spoiler review about this because anytime I'm doing a King book, I like to read it and I like to listen to it so that I can get both of the different uh, corresponding sort of, you know, it's, it's, King is a big proponent of audiobooks and with good reason. I love them. They help me get through books a lot quicker sometimes if I'm, you know, because I, I drive for the day job. And so for that reason, it's like, okay, I can get through a lot of this stuff. That's how I was able to get through, you know, um, I, this was like maybe two weeks ago at this point that I started the arduous process of going through all five of the Holly books leading up to this, you know, especially because The Outsider is a friggin' whopper of a book, man, in comparison with Holly. I think this one's like just barely, it's like four and some change. I just want to double, 
double check. Yeah, 449. So nothing crazy, about the same size as the first Hodges trilogy. And then, I mean, if it bleeds, there's three other stories in here that Holly is not a part of. And so that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, man, it, it, it was a process going through all those. And the Audible and uh, audio books, because I have some king on one and some king on the other, depending on credits I had and free promotions and what have you. But yeah, I, uh, I was able to get through all of these books and I have pages and pages of notes with regards to all five of the previous stories that Holly was involved with. So when I do the spoiler review, when I get the chance to actually give my countdown thoughts of ranking all of the Holly stories that she has been a part of, um, yeah, that's where I'm gonna really be able to cut loose with new impressions of some of those stories and also with just, you know, proper thoughts about stuff that I wish I could talk about right now because once again, the things that I really, really enjoyed and was just like, damn King, all right, get on with it, man. You know, that's where it's spoilery for me to talk about that sort of stuff. So yeah, I guess that is where I have to cut it out and uh, extend a grande gracias for anybody who is just potentially stumbling upon this review, especially since I'm not sure which of the two channels I'm affiliated with, whether it's my personal or the horror show, which one this is gonna end up on. But uh, yes, I have been Jaime in Fuego. You can find moi on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube, back on the Horror Show channel, um, if you are not watching that here. Um, I have 333 Stephen King episodes where I covered just about anything you could think of under the sun. Every single book, every single film, and all of the sequelized stuff. Like, you know, I classified them as films that forgot the face of their father. So we're talking Return to Salem's Lot, Pet Cemetery 2, uh, the, the Sometimes They Come Back sequels, you know, stuff like that. So all of the tie-in stuff, and we're about to get another one with this Pet Cemetery Bloodline that's coming out next month in October, I believe October 6th. It just recently made its debut at one of the festivals, and I, I've heard mixed things about it as I'm anticipating. I actually don't really mind Mary Lambert's Pet Cemetery 2 with, uh, with John Connor in it, but um, hey, so uh, I'm, I'm curious about that, so we'll definitely be reviewing that, but um, yeah, there is tons and tons of stuff in the Stephen King themed playlist that uh, if you want to uh, tickle your El Rey fancy, yes, you will find tons of awesomeness there. So I will bid you all adieu and uh, say until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike, and casual readers and viewers uh, alike. Say thank you. I am hopeful that we have been well met and we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, remember to stay scad. For all of you Horror Show Channel fans out there, make sure to check out uh, Dylan's New Nightmare, which is Cecil's Freddy Krueger fan film sequel to Wes Craven's New Nightmare. It's incredible. I have two songs on it. So stoked about that. It's truly a pleasure and an honor for our Chiron side project, Nancy, and the Nightmares to be a part of the process. And I'm super stoked for all the success he has seen since unleashing it upon the world a couple of weeks ago. So now as I veer back on course, back onto the path of the beam, remember everybody, read Stephen King. Give Holly Gibney another chance. Come on. <laughs>